is the killer 5G use case. So I'm Sunit Kumar, I'm a technical director with KPMG and I'm honored to be uh, moderating the panel. Uh, so right now how we have structured, we have a keynote followed by a panel. So we have uh, you know, some eminent speakers who will be sharing their insights and perspective on the topic. So uh, as we all know, right, it has been uh, a year since 5G has officially been launched at IMC last year. Now since then, India has expanded its 5G coverage to uh, various cities and towns across the country. So as we enter the second year, now you know, if we see um, the shift from the deployment of 5G now has been taken over to look at the various use cases for the implementation of on 5G. So the government and industry are now collaborating to explore the potential of 5G and the various sectors such as agriculture and other healthcare sectors, manufacturing sectors. Uh, we have seen multiple use cases that has evolved over the last year, but yet we are yet to see you know, some of the killer use cases that will transform the industry, not just the telecom, but the cross sectors and other industries as well. Now on this, uh, the future of 5G, as we see, you know, it's bright in India and promising. Uh, we'll be starting with the keynote. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Niang uh, Thia Soeng from head, he's the head of network solutions, strategic network evolution, market, Southeast Asia, Oceania, and India at Ericsson. So welcome uh, Dr. Thia Singh. So uh, Dr. Thia Singh has more than 19 years of experience in radio access technology, working in both operator and vendor environment. He is currently the regional head of network operations, uh, strategic network evaluation, and Ericsson Market Southeast Asia. He specializes in the spectrum and network evolution strategy. His main scope of work is mainly dealing with analyzing operators' networks, such as the best network evolution approach in achieving best network performance. Uh, over to you, Dr. Thiang. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tiao Singh. I'm based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Right. Good to be here. So, um, maybe we put up the slides. Yep. So, I will talk a little bit on 5G use cases. Right. <clears throat> if if you look at the the development on 5G till today, right, since the first network, which is launched in 2019, right. It has been four years, right? And uh, of course, <clears throat> four years, now we see more than 200 networks actually launch with 5G, right? And if you look at the first network which is launched with 5G today, which is Korea, actually 80% of the traffic in the network is actually carried through 5G, right? So 5G has been developed so fast, and the uptake is so fast, and it's actually faster than the the 4G that actually ha having the same evolution by two years, right? So if, <clears throat> if, if we look at the 5G adoption today, right? By end of this year, Ericsson actually forecasts it will have 1.5 billion 5G subscribers by end of this year. And it's more than 20% of the world five, uh, 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 mobile subscription uh, today, right? And in India, and they start, start to pick up, and by 2028, we expect 700 million 5G subscri uh, subscription will be in 2028, right? Of course, come back <clears throat> to, to the, the 5G as a platform for innovation. It provides much better availability, reliability, right? It's suitable for critical communication. So all this will bring new capability to enable new use cases, right? But of course, <clears throat> The, the most successful use cases, to be frank, up to today, it is still based on enhanced mobile broadband, right? It comes to it's more mobile <clears throat> uh, cloud gaming, right, and, and of course others. But then the second most successful use cases today, it has to come down to fixed wireless access, right? Ericsson, we ourselves track the number of fixed wireless access network launched globally, right? Up to today, we actually see close to 50% of all 5G networks that actually launch, launch 5G also launch with fixed wireless access. Compared to 4G, 4G you can't really talk about quality of service, right? You can't talk about 100 megabit per second you deliver to your home. You, we, we can't talk about that. 
But with 5G, we have larger chunk of spectrum, we have, you know, we, we have more capacity in the, in, in, in the network. Then, of course, the business case for 5G, for fixed wireless success, it actually makes sense compared to 4G, right? And also operators start to charge a higher premium compared to the 4G fixed wireless success because now it delivers a, a higher speed and it's also comparable with fixed broadband today. That's why around the world or even in India, you see the, the price actually launched on fixed wireless access, and it's more or less the same as the fixed broadband, right? And of course, it gives an advantage of fast time to market, right? If we look at the, the US, right, the, the four years they have launched, and in 2021, the net addition on the broadband is still very much based on wired line. And when it comes to last year, the net addition to the fixed broadband has shifted heavily to fixed wireless access, and it has continued for the past one and a half years. More than 90% of net add on, on the fixed broadband is actually based on fixed wireless access, right? So that's why we are saying that besides the EMBB, the next or the second most successful use case is actually fixed wireless access. On top of it, you have the connectivity, operators start to upsell on more on content. For example, the Netflix, you know, the, the OTT, all these applications is, is on top of it to, 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 to try to monetize. <clears throat> Maybe I go to this slide first, right? Then the second, <clears throat> after the fixed wireless access, we actually see operators start to do a lot of slicing, right? Everyone is talking about slicing, but where is actually the real use cases? The one use cases that I see very successful, and actually it come up with multiple operators, is actually on live broadcast and leveraging the uplink, right? For example, US, this is T-Mobile, right? In, in a cliff diving activity, right? I mean, cliff diving, that means it's cliff and um, you know, it's near the sea, right? In order to to really capture the good, good angle, they actually fly a drone, connect to a 5G, a cameras, then actually they follow the divers coming down, right? But in the event, there is so many, so many people, right? Of course, you need a very consistent uplink to send the good quality video back to the broadcast center to broadcast to the whole world. Then you need a slicing to guarantee some uplink performance Right? To, to have this video in really good quality. Not only in the US on the cliff diving, but also in UK, the, the King Coronation, right? This Vodafone UK is actually doing slicing for the cameras so you don't deploy the whole team to, to set up the, the satellite connection for the broadcast. Just with 5G, with slicing, a few cameras, make sure you guarantee 15 to 20 megabit per second, and it goes. Same for Marathon, Firestone in Taiwan. I mean, you, know, you can't sell up the, the car, the, the, the satellite everywhere because of Marathon for, for 42 km, right? This is the best use case to go, right? <clears throat> then, of course, come back to the network slicing. Singapore, last year, they actually do something more with slicing, right? What, what they do is in the F1 event, right? F1 event they deploy multiple cameras, right? And in the event, you, you sit on the F1 event. You just sit and wait for the, the car to come. Boom. Then you wait for another few minutes before the car come again, right? So what they do is put a multi, multiple cameras, and if you subscribe to this package, you actually see multiple corners using your apps. But during the event, there are so many people, and you are more or less guarantee your performance when you are actually watching using your phone, right? So slicing has been successful, not only on downlink, also uplink. The next one coming, which is the slicing for enterprise and also for consumer as well. We, we, we call it the URSP, right? The application now, it is smart enough to differentiate. If you do a gaming, they give you a different quality of service. It thanks to the OS of the phone, which is Android 12 and 13, and also Apple now, iOS 17, they support this type of functionality the URSP, then you are able to differentiate when you click on the application, they know, ah, this is actually a latency related, then they give you a better latency throughout the network, right? <clears throat> of course, 
the next big thing, of course, is come back to the network API, right? <clears throat> the operators has, has, has the network, right? But they, as you, you need to do exposure, get the applications from outside the world, come in to tell, ah, in this application, I need a good quality of service. Then the API will translate into the network configuration and make sure the network actually deliver the quality of service. Actually give opportunity for the operators to monetize on the northbound interface. The next big thing that we foresee is we come out to the glasses, right? Today we see VR. People have been talking about VR, but nothing much happened, right? But then we see a, a few operator, or a, a few vendors start to come out with, with a really good AR, uh, VR glasses like Apple. They, they just come out with the Vision Pro. The first step is to do is do a do a, a C2, right? It's a, a mix of a, VR together with AR, right? That means now it's not only seeing something which is within your, the content itself, but it's actually can see the AR, which is a mixed reality. When you see on the street, the signboard will start to pop out, you know, some information to get, get, get to that point, right? But this, with the bulky type of devices, it will not fly, right? So the evolution has to be come out to the optimization on the glasses to a small form factor, like the normal glasses. And the technology has to be evolved so that most of the processing pass back to the, pass back to the, the network, do the post-processing on the VR, and send back those information back to your AR glasses. Right? This we'll see, it will come, it will come out uh, <clears throat> in a big time, in a few years. Then when people actually comfortable with it, then we are talking about the all day, all day XR, right? Some industry or some analysts actually believe that the uptake of AR will be much bigger than the smartphone, right? But however, how to make the AR glasses in, in such a small form, right? A 3GPP actually start with 3G uh, in the release 17. They say that uh, now today, the biggest challenge on the device is the cost, right? Is the cost, right? 5G with the smartphone today is meant for high speed, for low latency, and of course the chipset will be expensive, right? So industries say that rather than have 100 megahertz of spectrum to get, get a one gigabit per second, I don't need that much. Why not I just stream it down to 20 megahertz by st stringing the spectrum to 20 megahertz the, the device cost actually can come down half, right? So we expect the rate cap type of device will come in in a cheaper format, between 30 to 40 US dollar to start with, and it will further come down, and it will accelerate devices like the glasses, the CCTV, the wearables. So these are devices will start to pop out next year. <clears throat> then of course, come back, to India, right? Actually, Ericsson actually do the, the consumer lab study. We, we give questionnaires to the users, right? If you have a 5G network, what do you actually want to see and willing to pay? Of course, and a better speed and also fixed wireless access, these two are the, the common one. But we also see that, yeah, they want something on the 3D or AR book, digital library, immersive replay, if I have a stadium, I have a car, uh, 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 a game, I want to replay it in a high quality. 3D hologram uh, messaging, enhanced event experience in a stadium, I want enhanced, uh, enhanced experience. And of course, the mobile gaming, right? From left to right, <clears throat> the willingness to pay actually goes up, right? This is actually from, from the Indian uh, co consumer, right? So the consumer actually willing to pay between 10 up to a 15, uh, up to a 17 percent premium with this out of a new uh, use cases, right? So with this, I hope I share something useful, and I pass it back to you. Thank you very much. All your insights on the new possibilities with the network slicing the FWA offering and over the some of the, you know, 5G along with some other examples that you have mentioned for the use cases of 5G, especially in the live broadcast, uh, cloud gaming, 
3D AR book. That was really insightful. Uh, thank you for thank you for the session. Hope it was en enlightful for the audience as well. So now we'll move to the panel. Uh, so in this panel discussion. So now we'll move to the panel discussion. So in this panel discussion, we'll get a better understanding of the potential and challenges of 5G technology. We'll explore some of the most promising 5G use cases that can transform various domains and sectors. We'll also learn from the experience and strategies of the industry leaders who has joined us in this panel, uh, who are the experts in leveraging 5G to create value and innovation in their organizations. Moreover, uh, we'll also look ahead to the future work pay, workforce needs in the 5G-driven world and how to prepare for them. We hope that this session will inspire you to think creatively about the opportunities of 5G and how to harness its powers for positive impact. Now, I'll request the panelists to come on the dice. So to begin, please allow me to introduce the panelists. Uh, we have with us Mr. Shantanu Mukherjee. Uh, he's the head of growth segments and Reliance Geo. Shantanu, please. Uh, in its current role, uh, Shantanu is focused on 5G consumer business and special projects. In his previous stints, Shantanu has held domestic and international leadership roles in business operations management, consumer products and services, and big data analytics. Our second speaker for the panel is Shilpa Malia Singhai. Is a, she's a managing director in the, in the CMT industry at, at Essential Strategy. As a distinguished professional, she has an extensive background within the communications and media sector. She has consistently campaigned uh, cutting-edge solutions, including 5G, cloud, and edge, and telco and techco transformation initiatives. Her experience spans over advising major players in the telecom and platform domains. Further uh, with us, we have Mr. Akshay Agarwal. Uh, he's the senior director of engineering, wireless system research and development at MediaTek. He is the global leader with more than two decades of technical and business leadership experience in the US, Taiwan, and India. He has played varied roles across engineering and research, marketing and business development, and organizational management. Uh, not last but the least, our fourth uh, speaker for the day is uh, David O'Brien. He is the senior business development manager at Druid Software, which is the leading provider of core software for private enterprise network. He's an experienced, enthusiastic business executive with a track record of planning and executing business strategy, managing complex programs, and driving innovation in telecoms, IT, financial services, and e-health at the global level. So um, welcome to all the panelists. So uh, I welcome to all the panelists. So uh, why don't we start with you know, um, Akshay Yu. So being from Geo, right? How you have seen the 5G technology evolved over the past year, and what are the, some of the key trends you know that has emerged in its implementation? Please, if you can you know provide some insights and lights for the audience on this aspect. Hi. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for having me on the panel. It's my honor to be a part of the IMC 2023. Um, so I think you asked a very relevant question as to how we have seen 5G evolve in the last uh, year particularly. So 5G overall globally has been um, launched since about 2018-2019 time frame. Um, China, uh, Europe, US were the first countries to adopt 5G. Um, and you know in India there was a long wait because spectrum allocations and spectrum auctions that had to happen and finally they happened last year, in the middle of last year. And the spectrum auctions happened in the C-band. So once the auctions happened, the major telcos, they grabbed all the, the spectrum, which was very much needed. And um, so the C-band spectrum was, was deployed. And then um, uh, in around Independence Day, our Honorable Prime Minister, he launched 5G services in India. Ever since then, 5G actually has been in an upswing in India. So to quote some statistics, I think about 28 uh, states right now have 5G. Um, and there are about 300 to 400,000 base stations that have been launched in about 700 cities in India. Uh, in India, you know, there have been two networks, SA, which is standalone networks, and the non-standalone networks that have been uh, launched. So uh, one of the, our panelists over here from GEO, so they have been the pioneers in the SA network, which is very challenging to, um, to launch. 
and the NSA, which is, um, you know, which is a carryover from uh, 4G, is the, the more traditional, the more conventional network that has been launched. So both these networks have been launched, and um, ever since you know, these services have been launched, the number of subscribers have been increasing. So currently, I think we have about 100 million subscribers, and as the previous keynote person said, um, this number is expected to go to about 700 million by 2028, which is a big number. So I think um, 5G has been on the rise. Talking about the use cases, there are uh, many use cases that you can see. In fact, in the conference itself, uh, there are many agriculture use cases where you can see that uh, 5G is helping the farmers uh, and the agriculturists to see you know, what is happening in their farms or industry 4.0, where you can see some more automation happening, or um, in the medical field, uh, things are happening. But again, uh, one of the most promising ones, again, which the, the keynote uh, uh, speaker addressed, is the uh, fixed wireless access. So this fixed wireless access has a lot of potential. Uh, specifically in India, I would say. See, in developed countries, they have a lot of fiberization, so fixed wireless access could be, um, you know, something if I may say, nice to have. But in India, it becomes a must-have because the fiberization that is in India is about 30% or so. So because it's 30%, you need you know, more and more of um, these broadband services which can be bought through fixed wireless access. So I think that's a pretty important one. No, no, so, uh, yeah. so agree to that point. Uh, so uh, Shantanu, you know, from, as mentioned by Akshay as well, so how do you see, you know, as from the geo point of view, what are the technology, how you have seen it evolving, especially on the FWA, uh, if you can put some insights and enlighten, right, uh, what are the other cases that geo is working as of now or that you have worked across in the last one year? Because we have seen that shift, right, from every of the operators, especially geo. Now there's a shift from not just deploying the network, but coming up with the use cases for the industry. So please, if you can add some value on that. Sure. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. It's, been, it's an honor to be here and uh, presenting, uh, sharing my views with the audience. Um, and my apologies if, I <clears throat> if my voice is not so great. Um, so here's a couple of things, right? One is, I think, over the past year, what we've seen is uh, internationally, uh, networks have uh, started going and deploying standalone technology. Traditionally, as Akshay pointed out, uh, everybody had uh, started by deploying NSA, non-standalone, which is really using your 4G core and trying to give 5G, which is not really a great way to do it. Uh, and it has therefore borne out Geo's decision. We were the first and only greenfield operator to launch SA, and at such a scale. Um, uh, more than one million cells of 5G rolled out, 85% uh, of the capacity of 5G that's rolled out in India is by, is by Geo. And we have pretty much covered the whole of India. Uh, by December 23, we'll, we'll pretty much cover everything. And within, and, and uh, Akshay has, as Akshay pointed out, that uh, internationally networks had rolled out much earlier, but it's a matter of great pride for India that in less than a year, we are right there on top amongst the top four or five across the world in pretty much every KPI that you can think of, right? So uh, pretty much in, in most of these, we are in the top three. So one of the things that's evolved is in terms of how now people are moving into SA. Uh, and that uh, gives a huge flip in terms of the kind of experience and the kind of use cases that one can sort of deploy. The other thing which is interesting is that the topic here is where is the f killer 5G use case, right? In my view, is that uh, that was something that we were looking at about a year ago. I think what has evolved and the way it has evolved it is that it is no longer about the killer 5G use case. It's about how now 5G is evolving and uh, applications are evolving across industries and finding their own niches, their own ways of evolving and developing those use cases which are really transforming those industries. And that is across, right? So uh, we, you know, uh, if you talk about connected healthcare, for example, right? Combination of uh, cloud, combination of 5G upload speeds, which helps you 
uh, handle huge uh, image files, and a you know portable uh, uh, telepathology unit. You can transform women's uh, healthcare across remote locations in this entire country, and that's exactly what we are doing and testing out right now. Uh, FWA is something which is anyway, uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, that's happening across the world. And with SA and with now, again, the first unique deployment of millimeter wave, uh, you know, it's going to transform uh, the experiences for uh, consumers and enterprises alike. Media is something that was there in the keynote speaker's uh, presentation. And it's not just about how you're going to transform the media industry for the media company, for the media broadcaster. In the IPL, uh, in Geo Cinema, for the first time, uh, we deployed 360 content, and which was probably the largest consumption of immersive content anywhere in the world in that kind of a scale. So what's happening is, it's no longer about the killer use case, a particular killer use case that we are hunting for, right? If you look at it, every industry, I mean, look at it, think about it, that you're a small business owner, right? You have your own, you have, a, you, have, you, have, you have a fantastic food outlet, right? But you don't really have the capacity, you don't have the ability to go and advertise. So Geo with NVIDIA is building a com platform for AI. You, that person, that business owner will have access to that. And within seconds, you can generate your own advertisement just by using text and word prompts. Right and uh, you know uh, using 5G for uh, the bandwidth and using cloud to do that entire thing without any kind of infrastructure requirement at the end consumer's end. So what's happening is you have multiple use cases that are coming up across industries. You have multiple technologies emerging and delivering all those use cases. So, thank you, sh no, you Shantanu. You know, on that note, when you mentioned multiple technologies, so I have a question for you, Shalpan, coming from the industry, as you mentioned. You know, how do you see you know, other evolving technologies or emerging technologies collaborating with 5G you know, as a convergence? Now, how do you see that convergence amplifying the capabilities of 5G? Um, I, I'll also take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, um, the organizers to give me an opportunity to sit with this. Uh, confluence of minds and speak here. Uh, on that question, uh, I think much has been talked about how critical the convergence of emerging technologies is going to be on this platform that is 5G, if I can call it so. Uh, we've been, you know, it's an entire spectrum that experimentation and innovation is happening across. Uh, on one hand, there are the most uh, exponential cases, and on the other, there are also some things that are commercially viable um, and are very much in use in application and gaining traction. I pick two examples uh, that we at Accenture have uh, seen a lot of success in. Uh, one of them is uh, what we touched upon earlier in the uh, keynote as well as some mentions from Akshay and Shantanu around transforming the uh, gaming experience altogether. So with Trelstra, Marvel St Stadium and Accenture have come together in a collaboration where uh, they've come up with an uh, innovative AR platform uh, and a solution really, which really transforms the way uh, the audience consumes the game. And it spans across the life cycle of consumer walking in uh, there is wayfinding solutions, there is a lot of pivotal digital interactions that are enabled. All of this is on the backbone of 5G. The other very, very uh, important transformational and industry-defining work that uh, we're doing is with Walt Disney. Uh, the Walt Disney Studio Lab uh, is working with us to pull together a combination of what we call as photogrammetry and an immersive collaborative platform, which has completely transformed how pre-production, post-production really happens. Essentially, now they're able to take a couple of pictures and put it in through the system and reimagine the entire storytelling on the basis of the 3D models that the platform creates. And without having to really go into the studio, they can collaborate across certain locations and create. So the whole creation story is transformed using all of this. 
and while it may not look like uh, you know it, it's it's an innovation at at the confluence of these emerging technologies it may not look like a, a very strong 5g use case but all of this is only working well on 5g network and connectivity so i think um, it's definitely going to be uh, a journey of evolution and we are getting there where 5G becomes more of a necessity for some of these applications as the applications evolve and, and we see more and more use of uh, some of these use cases. Okay, so now no, um, what I believe, right, we talked about some of the sectors, we talked about the technologies. Uh, to you, David, you know, what question that I have in particular is we, we have to talk about the adoption the user adoption and acceptance of, you know, how important you believe this is, and what are the strategies that can be, you know, um, deployed or employed to encourage these adoption on a broad scale, because end of the day, it's getting the users to, you know, use this technology, and then I think so more or multiple use cases or the killer use cases that, you know, we talked about, or which Shantanu also highlighted, that is going to come up. So what is your perspective or some insight that you can bring from the global perspective or from the industry that, you know, uh, that that is there. Yeah, so uh, I guess our perspective is slightly uh, different in that we are really focused on the enterprise sector uh, and on the private network uh, aspect of uh, 5G. Uh, one thing that we have seen in the last year is a lot of the focus of the 5G use cases and the 5G business case uh, really focusing in on industrial requirements, enterprise requirements. Um, it certainly has consumer applications, as uh, the, the, the keynote pointed out, but uh, so much of the focus now is really going into the enterprise sector, where I think it, it belongs, and that's what a lot of the 5G uh, specification development was focused on from the very beginning. And I was delighted to hear Shantanu say that the, the, the search for a single killer app is possibly uh, not the right way to think about it. I, uh, I often say to, to customers and consultants, is there a killer app for electricity? Is there a killer app for running water? You know, these, these are infrastructure developments and the, the concept of the killer app tends to f push businesses down the road of trying to find one thing that I will do with 5G that will justify the cost of the network, that will justify all of the investment that I need to do to deliver this network. And if I can't get this use case from this, from get this business value from this single use case, then I won't invest. This is like saying I'm building a road and I'm gonna put one truck of goods down this road and this truck has to justify the entire cost of the road. The second truck will be free, but this first truck has to be worth 100 million rupee to me or I'm not building the road. It, it's a wrong way of thinking about it. Businesses should be thinking about this the same way as they think about any other infrastructure development and really looking for the total cost of ownership and the total benefit of ownership across the whole thing. In terms of uh, the, the, the question you asked about um, a, what will drive adoption, of course in each different industry vertical there will be specific things that drive uh, uh, adoption. Um, one of the places that we are seeing um, if, you, if you try to look at it in a general way, places where data is critically important to achieving speed and efficiency. So one of the great examples of this is, is ports or warehouses or airports where freight is involved, where the critical business uh, driver is to get the ship in and out as quickly as possible with the right things on it and get the, the goods that come off, off the ship onto trucks or trains and to market as quickly as possible. So you have data, what's on the ship, where is it, where is it right now, uh, how quickly does it need to be moved, where does it need to be moved to, and you need to move that data at super high speeds in order to deliver uh, business value. So we're seeing huge pickup in things like location-based services, uh, computer-based services, uh, the, the coupling of AI together with the data that can come from the private network. This is really revolutionizing uh, the whole industry of, of logistics, which has been very topical because we had the, the ship crashing in the Suez Canal and then we had the whole COVID with the effect on supply chain. So people are really looking at supply chains and how they can make them more efficient and that's where we're seeing a lot of the interest right now. Okay. Um, thank you, David, on that. Uh, Shantanu, on the same point which just David mentioned, uh, is there any specific you know, sector, because you also talked about some of the use cases which is there for the sectors, but do you believe is there any specific industry or sector where this you know, 5G is poised to have that more significant impact? Or you know, what do you think, you know, which type of use cases you know, that will be driving these transformations? 
You know, I truly believe that uh, it's not just about a specific sector, right? And uh, of course, uh, you know, David spoke about Industry 4.0 uh, as part of the enterprise, uh, which is which has always been the dream as far as 5G is concerned, right? Right from beginning, saying that oh, low latency, huge capacity, uh, and we're going to transform the automated robots and and remote working. And, and you can see all of that, by the way, here and now, working, touch and feel, demonstrate for your, you know, sh uh, see it for yourself, live demonstrations. If you and I encourage you, if you haven't, go to the geo booth. You will, you will see an incredible array of use cases there. Uh, but as I said, that it's not just about large enterprises. It's not just about a single industry. Uh, it is going to benefit even that small shopkeeper or even that small store owner, right? So think about it this way, right? So 5G is the uh, core connectivity layer, right? And it's important to have that core connectivity uh, as ubiquitous right, and uh, really delivering in terms of its potential, right, and so therefore we have the SA, ubiquitous 5G layer covering all of India, right, and with uh, that kind of uh, performance uh, capacity, latency, speed, etc. And on top of that you have the platform, right, with core partners coming in with that platform and delivering all of the applications, all of the use cases across different verticals. That vertical can be healthcare, that vertical can be small businesses, it can be warehousing, it can be, you know, uh, banking, branches and operations, end to end, right? And so therefore you will have all of these coming in across different verticals and delivering these, the benefits and the use cases across all of these uh, different verticals. I mean, think about it look at it from a perspective of, let's say, even um, something like uh, uh, skill development, right? I mean, if you combine artificial intelligence, if you combine the upload uh, capacity and the latency of 5G, and if you combine, uh, you know, collaboration uh, on something like, let's say, a Geo Meet or Teams or Google Meet, whatever, you suddenly are able to overcome the barrier of distance and language in the case of, let's say, a use case which is to do with training, which is to do with skill development. And you have a trainer here sitting, you know, let's say in a place who's delivering a training in English. And across thousands of locations, that same thing is getting delivered and received in local languages. And all of this is happening online. Okay, so this, that's AI, cloud, 5G, all coming together and collaborative tools all coming to look together and delivering that, right? So in my view, you are going to see this evolving furiously and very, very fast. And you will see pretty much this getting implemented and the benefits getting deployed across industries, right? But obviously, you know, stuff like gaming, XR, et cetera, those are obviously going to be uh, significantly ahead in terms of the fact that those are the most obvious ones which you will get impacted by. But truly, uh, I passionately believe that this is going to transform industries and consumer experiences across. Please, please, Shilpa. See, I think uh, when it comes to Industry X or B2B domain, uh, we need to start thinking a little differently in terms of, you know, there is a lot of uh, questioning around where's the killer use case, where's the killer use case. And the basic thing to understand and, to, and, and the approach that needs changing is that many of these uh, technologies are going to be foundational when there is a transformation already in the play in the industry. So some of these uh, use cases are automatically popping up as there are some inflection points in the industry and there is infrastructure modernization or there's a digital transformation that is undertaken by a particular industry. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we started working with uh, one of the mining companies, largest mining companies, and uh, we started discussing about uh, 5G use cases. For some time, we put that agenda aside because the conversation then involved into digital transformation and total digital transformation, of which then uh, over a period of time, 
uh, by natural course of how the digital transformation went, several use cases emerged and they are in action on the ground implemented today, which require 5G uh, networks. So I think the approach of looking for a use case going after it is probably also not the right lens. There is an evolution of the industry and the trans digital transformation lens that we have to put and then the rest follows. Yep. I'd actually like to, to add to, to build on what Shilpa said as well. That's, that's, we've had very similar experiences in industrial applications where we go to the factory floor and speak to the people there and say, what if this could be done? Uh, what, what would that benefit you? How would that change how, how your company produces goods or does its business? And the amount of innovative use cases that we literally would never have heard of or thought of ourselves, because we don't do that every day, that these guys and girls on the shop floor can come up with, it's remarkable. Um, 5G is an amazing enabler for innovation, and I think one of the key things that, that the whole ecosystem has to do is to free up people to do that innovation, um, both uh, commercially but also uh, from a regulatory point of view. The barrier between businesses being able to put networks out, talk to their own staff, develop use cases, have companies build technology that, that enables these use cases on top of the platform, we need to make that pipeline as free-flowing as possible. So the, the easier it is to put a private network out, the easier it is to put this technology to work in all sorts of ways, that's when we're really going to harness the innovative and creative abilities of lots of people and get lots of, of, uh, of new products and services that we're not even thinking of right now. Yeah, so no, on that aspect, right, we do see, we do get that insight. But one of the main in, you know, aspect, uh, I think, so which we have not touched till now, and uh, Akshay, I want your opinions, particular in that, is the infrastructure investment. Yeah. So coming from media techno, if you can actually talk about something, you know, from the infrastructure with development that is there in the 5G and technology, how it is evolving, from the infrastructure perspective, you know, the requirements and infra, you know, um, investments which is required to you know, support it, it's widespread and deployment. So how do you take that to support the evolvement and in the use case? Because everything is going to be on the particular use cases until unless you have that base infrastructure, which is still there and it is evolving, right? So it is the necessity and how rapidly it can change. So I think that's a very good question. So I think what I'd like to say first of all is the onus of infrastructure um, investment is not just on one, uh, one particular um, entity such as the telco. It should be mixed and it should be uh, shared by all the players who are responsible for democratizing 5G. So let's start with the, um, I would say the government for example. So I think what the government would need to do is um, they would need to subsidize certain things. For example, uh, make an India concept you know, all the base stations that are being deployed or all the devices that are being made, if they can have some good policies, uh, we can have more and more number of base stations that are deployed at an affordable pricing. Talking about private 5G networks, I think one of the issues in India is that, you know, there is no spectrum that is being allocated by the government, you know, to deploy this private 5G. So if uh, government is able to, uh, you know, come up with some spectrum, the 5G networks could take off uh, in, the, in, the, in the private space. So secondly, I would say, okay, so that's, that's from the government perspective. From chipset companies like MediaTek, I think it's very important for us that we continue to innovate and put more money in chip development so that we are able to come up with more and more chipsets so that we can have affordable devices. We have a dimensity series of products um, which have been powering about 40% of the 5G handsets that are sold worldwide today. Uh, so we, we should get that number up to 50% and more affordable. Um, the third thing I could uh, uh, probably think about is that um, fiberization is very important. So you need to get more and more fiber out there so that connectivity is increased. And wherever fiberization is not possible, um, you know, have more fixed wireless access devices. Uh, for that also it is important that um, the ecosystem is able to come together and make attractive 5G plans. Um, similarly, there's an important technology for 5G which I think nobody has talked about today is uh, NTN non-terrestrial networks. I think that's very important because you'd be amazed to see that uh, worldwide, there's about 50 to 60 percent of the geographical mass that is not accessible uh, by base stations. So how do you access that? And that could only be done if you have these uh, networks out there uh, which can talk to the satellites and satellite communication happens. 
So thankfully, 3GPP has got something called NTN, non-terrestrial networks, which have been standardized, um, and MediaTek has played an important role in that. We've got some devices out there which can do some messaging and some phone calls. So that is a key technology. And also, uh, ecosystem players have to work together to come up with some partnerships. For example, um, you know, MediaTek and um, Ericsson, we did a, a partnership on red cap devices, which the uh, keynote speaker also you know, referred to. These red cap devices are something which are low energy devices, which can make uh, the deployment more easy. And last but not the least, I think onus is also on each one of us as users to give 5G technology a chance and, and adopt it in some way or the other in our lives so that you know, it could be more uh, meaningful to everybody. Yeah, uh, sorry, just one yeah, sure. quick uh, thing, and I'm glad you mentioned NTN. So if you go to the geo booth, yeah. you can actually go and test Space out Space Fiber. Fiber. Yeah, yeah. And we are the only uh, operator who has a gigabit connectivity yes, on uh, I saw that. NTN. And you can actually go and test out. We've deployed it in Gear Forest. You can actually uh, uh, live test out a gigabit uh, yes. connectivity on yeah. uh, satellite yeah. at the geo booth. Yeah, you got air fiber and space fiber. It's very impressive. Yes, sure. Uh, th thank you for, for that, Shantan and Akshay. So, no, um, David, no, on that aspect, when we talked about um, the fiber aspect and other things, so one thing I wanted to you know, understand from you, right? What if he sees the possibilities with 5G? So what are the ethical, commercial, regulatory aspects that should be considered, you know, to ensure the responsible and sustainable use of this technology? I think from a, from a regulatory point of view, and uh, we already touched on it here, um, I think making Spectrum available directly to enterprise uh, as part of the, the Spectrum auction process for 5G is, is very important. Right. Uh, it doesn't preclude success in private cellular. Uh, a lot of countries have not uh, enabled uh, uh, businesses to get spectrum themselves and have still got a successful ecosystem for private networks. But in terms of the, the innovative drive for it, I think markets like Germany and the US, Japan have, have uh, I think, done the right thing. And I hope that that, uh, that decision is, uh, is, is re-examined uh, when we get into the next rounds of spectrum auctions in a few years' time in, in India, because I think private spectrum is very important. From, from uh, the, the general you know, life on earth point of view, I think power consumption and the reduction of power consumption with things like the red cap technology, also using uh, things like smart NIC cards in, in uh, hardware is something that we've uh, done as well to be able to massively increase the, the data throughput while massively decreasing the power requirement uh, on, on edge hardware is a really important thing just for you know, from a, a general uh, climate change uh, augmentation or offset point of view. So I think those are the, the two main things that we need to, uh, to consider going forward. Okay, so I have been indicated that uh, we are almost out of time, but just given you know, just a last question um, on the topic, because we do believe the opportunities which 5G has been bring in and the use cases that we talked about you know, across industries. But there is one fear about, you know, it's more on uh, what the implications on the workforce and skill sets uh, development which is there. So, uh, Shilpa, if you can help us or if you can just from the industry perspective that you have worked across industries, what do you think, you know, prepare the workforce, what they have to prepare for the jobs for the future uh, from in the, this 5G technology, how it is evolving? So research says that 5G is um, set to create 22 million jobs across the global value chain. Uh, while not all of this will be housed inside the telcos, really. Uh, but we definitely have a huge gap. According to the Telecom Skill Council, uh, there is a 28% gap closer home in India as well. And that translates to about 8 million jobs. Uh, my sense is that Many of these jobs are going to be filled in uh, with proper upskilling and reskilling rather than creating, uh, you know, a new group of people that will be inducted into the industry. However, these uh, these skill uh, areas are clearly identified. So there are four areas where uh, skills we are short on skill or skills are required to be developed. Uh, the first one is network engineering. Uh, the second one more around cloud computing expertise uh, in parts. Uh, the third 
is around getting the right set of skills of uh, data science or data engineering. And interestingly, across applications, we're seeing a huge demand for user experience skills or user experience testers, essentially, designers and testers both. That's been one big lever of creating uh, that demand. And yes, a large ecosystem of uh, regulatory mandates, of government initiatives, of uh, telecom-funded incubators, uh, learning incubators, as well as the larger players, third-party players, has to come together for this upskilling to happen. So 100 labs that the government, uh, PM Modi uh, talked about and the government has invested in uh, across the country are actually hotbeds of some of the skilling and reskilling. 12 of them are incubators that the telecom companies in India are collaborating with the government to uh, put focus on. So some of this will result in massive upskilling, uh, at least in India, we see in the coming year. Could I, could I just add to that? Um, that that's a, a really great analysis of the, re the requirements for staff to make these networks happen. <clears throat> excuse me, make these networks happen. But I also like to look at it from the point of view of the impact on workers who are not in the telecommunications industry. And there is a certain amount of fear that AI will take your job or massive automation or digital transformation will take your job. I think this is a, a, a complete chimera. It's not going to happen. There is literally not enough universities to train all of the skilled people we need in education, in healthcare, in life sciences, in engineering. The way that we do upskilling and education and training has got to transform because we are literally not going to have enough skilled people the way we do education and, uh, and, and role formation today. And the power of ubiquitous 5G, as uh, Shantu pointed out, the, the power of this to, to radically transform the way we do education and upskilling gives us the chance to, to, to virtually have 10x the number of universities and training schools that we have today. You can use, and this is already being done in, in, uh, by, by uh, customers of ours, they're using uh, virtual environments uh, with uh, low latency private networks to train workers to work in pharmaceutical companies so that they can very quickly give them all of the experience that it would take them years to get in the real world and rapidly upskill them and bring them into the workforce. You have in the oil and gas, the mining industries, a cadre of people nearing the end of their working life who have all of the experience and the knowledge but don't want to go out working on oil wells anymore. And a huge cadre of younger people who are perfectly happy as a 25-year-old guy is to jump in a helicopter and go out to an oil rig for a month, but they don't know what to do. 5G is helping to bridge the gap between the people who have the knowledge and the people who are able to go to the places where the knowledge is required with things like smart helmets, AR. The, the impact of 5G technology uh, on how we do training and how many skilled workers we have, I think is, is going to be transformative. I don't think 5G is going to be bad for jobs. I think it's going to be bad for bad jobs. And it's <coughs> going to create a lot more good jobs. Thank, thank you for the insights to all the panelists. I think so, and it should be an intriguing session for all the uh, members who are here, uh, to the audience as well. Uh, I think so, we are out of time, but um, if you allow, uh, if we, if audience has any questions, we can take two or three questions at max. So if there's any questions from the audience, I think so, the panelists, and we will be more than happy to take that uh, questions if there's any. Uh, since we are almost out of time, if there's no questions, then uh, we can wrap this up. Yeah. Good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Shagun. Actually, I was just thinking that uh, something killer 5G use case, which we will actually just find out um, with this discussion. So my question is, uh, since we are actually exploring what could be the 5G killer use case, because somehow a lot of investment is actually already put in, in into you know 5G rollout. So how we are going to monetize this this is one question which I, I can foresee and that's how we can, you know, get an answer also that what could be the killer 5G use case. I hope uh, my question is clear. So basic, basically it is about the how we are going to monetize. Um, see, what we said is that you don't really have a killer use case. I think that's what 
uh, we said, but what's, go what's happening is that 5G along with emerging technologies, AI, cloud, uh, is really transforming multiple industries at the same time, right? And because we are able to deliver relevant applications, right, whether it is for enterprises, large enterprises, or small businesses, or end consumers, right, that is where the monetization is going to come from. So if you are, let's say, as a consumer, if you are an avid gamer, and uh, Geo tells you that, hey, listen, you're an avid gamer, and I can give you a slicing-based uh, service, which will give you an edge over others who do not have that in terms of great latency, and you are going to win every time, you're definitely going to pay more for that, right? And similarly, across all of that, that's what's happening. So therefore, that is what you will see, you know, as we go along, and that is where the monetization is going to come from. That entire concept of saying that, oh, let me go after a single use case, and I think David uh, really explained that very well, is really not happening, right? What's happening is that you will have hundreds and hundreds of use cases which is going to really uh, deliver that monetization. Let me also add to that. I think uh, I touched upon this earlier as well that we are looking for one killer use case and Shantun said that maybe that's not the right approach. Look, I think we are all looking for that use cases because there is a certain amount of investments that have gone in. And the question of monetization comes because we are trying to reap benefits for the industry, for the entire global value chain that is there. And if you look at what's working, that's where the use case is. So like, for example, fixed wireless access. Shantanu spoke about it, Akshar spoke about it. Um, the current numbers look like we have about 100 million uh, connections around the world. And uh, looking at where Geo is going, uh, another 150 will be added right from India. I don't see a challenge there uh, at all. In any case, with or without India going there, there is about 300 to 400 million forecast in the next five years for an FWA. And the typical ARPU for this broadband is at least four to five X, depending on which country you are. So there you have your monetization lever, which is FWA. So I think while the industry is going to evolve and there are gaming is uh, a B2C use case and use cases are there, immersive experience will pop up. But what's working is something that we can't put aside. That's one of the important use cases that is really bringing in the money. Yeah. Just to add on, you know, if, as Dr. Theosang also mentioned in one of the survey, the users are willing to pay 10 to 17 percent premium on the use case, you know, different types of usage, which there can be on the 5G network. So there's where your monetization also comes up, where the more premium rates can be leveraged. Yeah, Sunit, thanks for the clarity, but uh, just want to add, because currently we are actually just implementing 5G and uh, the talk of 6G rollout is also started, right? And the way yesterday even PM also mentioned that we, we should, you know, set the barriers for, you know, 6G rollout. So somewhere we have seen 3G because some whatever investment we have done in 3G was not monetized completely. Then we came into the 4G era. And currently we are into 5G and we are talking about 6G. Mm -hmm. So somewhere I was just linking because a lot of when we, you are adding 1G into uh, a, a, you know network, there is an investment of lakhs, lakhs of crores of worth, right? So somewhere that monetization was actually hitting, so that's what I asked this question. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's a very good point. So I'd like to put a little twist on this. You know, I mean, people may or may not want to hear this, but when 5G was being launched, there was a lot of hype that was created around this. There will be like sub latency, you know, and uh, all this, uh, et cetera, et cetera, was being done. So yes, some of those things have not come to reality. Hopefully they will do come to reality. So while we're defining 6G in 3GPP conferences, I think people are, are very much aware of the fact that you know, a reality has to be set in you know, when you're defining a new standard. And because of which, what's happening is when 6G standards are being defined right now, uh, they're in the very early stages, I think a lot of focus is being put on the, the use cases and how realistic they can be. So, so far, you know, things like immersive, holographics, or low energy devices are the, the use cases that they're thinking about in 6G. However, companies are cognizant of the fact that you know, given the, the 5G experience, we have to be m more careful in defining the new 6G technologies. So I think you're right there. Um, very quickly, I, I think it's the scientist's job to look out and go, oh, 6G, 7G, and I think it's the engineer's job to actually build 5G. 
and uh, the business people's job to make business, make, make a profit from doing 5G. So my, my word to the, the 3GPP committees is always, take another five minutes for the coffee break. It's okay. We don't need 6G for a good few years yet. Thank My question uh, is to David. Uh, David, you mentioned about uh, B2B, uh, and we are talking about use cases. I definitely, uh, I visited the airport, you know. When I check in, it takes two hours for me to, you know, board the uh, aircraft. If we talk about future, right, I want to just check in my luggage on the trolley, and trolley takes it to the aeroplane. I just sit in the aeroplane, board the, uh, you know, aircraft, land here in Delhi, right? go to the conference, right? And you have cameras there, scientifically we can see that you can recognize a person not only by face, but by also the way they walk, right? So, and we need high speed internet uh, 5G for it. When can I go to a future ready airport? How far we are from a future ready airport where things just happen on the network? Thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a great vision. I, anybody who had to fly to get here dreams at some point of being able to just get out of the, the car or the taxi and without breaking stride walk straight through the airport and get onto the plane and sit down and, and have your bags magically float behind you. Um, when is that going to happen? This is the, the border between technology and regulation. And this is always the tricky bit because regulators have to be focused on worst case analysis rather than best case analysis. They have to look for ways to stop things happening rather than ways to enable things happening. I think it's, it, it will only happen when uh, regulators and uh, security officials and government officials have supreme confidence in the technology. And I think that will come when they start to adopt it themselves. And we're seeing in India, uh, thanks to the, the government's um, foresight on this, they're starting to do a lot of e-government applications. And I think this is the, the first step towards building that confidence. In terms of when, when this will really happen, I'm not betting that when I come to IMC next year that this will have happened already, but uh, I certainly do believe that this, this is the way, the way we will go. We're already seeing it in shopping, right, uh, in, in some pilots in the US where you go in, you pick up your goods and you leave, and the system figures out how much you owe and takes it out of your bank account. So it, w it will happen. I'm just not betting on it being next year. Okay, um, I think we're almost out of time, so we are already extended. So, if it's just a short question, we can take it. Sure, thanks. So, uh, in the earlier discussions on enterprise digital transformation, it was a very interesting point that was laid out by the panel. Uh, they said that 4G was the driver of digitizing front end uh, in India, and 5G will be the driver of digitizing the back end. Uh, which means that the entire focus as of now uh, on, on 5G and monetizing 5G is on enterprises. Now, that's where I wanted to put this question that while we are not discussing a killer use case here, but is the focus solely on enterprises because the consumers are getting 5G experience currently for free? So, what's, what's the take on that? Uh, I would say yes, and my friend from Geo would say no. <laughs> No, no, let me, sorry, let me clarify. What I would say is that it is not only from enterprises. Uh, you heard uh, Shilpa's talk about FWA, which is what we call as air fiber. Geo has an ambition of connecting 200 million homes on air fiber. And that is where the money is coming from internationally at this point of time, right? That is not enterprise. That is absolutely consumer. It's connecting your home and my home and giving high-speed broadband experience, right? And by the way, that is going to transform enterprises as well because you have hundreds of small and medium enterprises. You have, uh, you know, these uh, business parks, etc., where it is a task to provide fiber, optical fiber back, uh, broadband, right? So it's going to transform not just the experience for consumers, it is going to transform the experience in terms of what they need right now for small and medium enterprises as well as some large enterprises, right? So effectively, uh, what we are saying is that your, uh, you, know, uh, you know, experience, the back end, back, you know, the back end as you're talking about from enterprises perspective, or to a certain extent, to a very large extent, in terms of how it is going to transform your experience at the front end as well. I mean, the 
uh, the example that I took up about a small and medium enterprise generating your own ads using a front end which is powered by AI and so on and so forth is really giving that power to the end consumer, right? So it's, it's going to be a bit of both, but it's definitely going to be transformational and it's going to be magical and it's happening as we speak. So I'd like to say that, you know, in 4G, the focus was on customers or consumers, B2C, but I think in 5G is a mix. And one of the ways to, you know, see that is uh, the focus on enterprises slicing, for example. You know, in slicing, you are actually giving focus to many industries, specifically, you're targeting them, whether it's healthcare or whether it's like swimming competitions or marathons, et cetera, and private networks, for example. You know, there also more focus is being given to enterprises. So I think 5G is targeting both the consumers, like this FWA, and also the B2Bs, and trying to monetize uh, wherever it can. So the B2C FWA is, is already monetizing, and hopefully with the slicing and this private networks, you can also see monetization coming from the uh, industries. That's what I think. I think so. Hope that uh, answers your question. So I think we uh, more than the time that you know we, that was allotted. So I really thank you all for joining us for this uh, insightful and lively discussion that we have. Uh, I think so. That's all from us today. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed uh, the session. We have another sessions on the same topic that will be after this sessions. Uh, please give a round of applause to the panelists, you know, to, for the wonderful insights and their uh, stories that they had from the industry. So th thank you all. Thank you for the session.